All right, let's get started. New setting today. It's hot in the attic, so I'm in my room. <clears throat> but yeah, we are back with our Thursday message as usual. So today, we're going to wait a couple minutes for people to come on in. And then we are going to go ahead and get started. Amen. And I'm excited about this message because I think a lot of times, too, what we do is we downplay what we're actually going through at times. And I think that it's a problem that we do that at times because God wants us to be real. And I think God wants us to be really real with ourselves, with what we're going through, and who he really is in our lives. Because the enemy goes about as a roaring lion, and he seeks who he may devour, but... God has come to give us life and it more abundantly when Satan tries to come to kill, steal, and destroy. Amen. So we got to really be real with who we are today. We got to be real with our struggles because Satan is very real, but we also got to be real with who God is and who he is in our lives. So today we're going to be talking about being real with our struggles because this is something that I think we downplay a lot as Christians. And we feel like we can't struggle or go through something because we are a Christian. But today, I just want to talk about this because I believe God wants us to be real. Because he reveals to heal, as I always say. But we, he cannot heal what we conceal. Amen? If we conceal a matter, if we conceal um, hurt and pain, he can't heal it because it's not exposed. God has to expose the very thing so that he, he can bring healing to it, right? So we got to realize that God is a healer. God is a deliverer. But we have to be real with God. You know, even to be forgiven, we have to confess with our mouth, amen, our sins to God. And he's faithful and just to forgive us, but also cleanse us from unrighteousness. So when we forget, when we confess our sins to God, he doesn't only forgive us, but he cleanses us. You know, that cleansing process, that sanctification process is literally the deliverance process because the word sanctify, a definition for the word sanctify can be uh, re rendered holy. And, you know, for us to be holy before God, we have to go through the sanctification process. Amen. You know, we have to be open to the deliverance process, be open to everything that God has for us today. Amen. So we're just going to open up with a word of prayer and then we're going to get started. So Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for all that you're doing in our lives, God. And we just lift up this word unto you right now, God. And I ask you, God, to have your way, God. We dedicate this time to you. And God, I pray through this word that you would show us that it's okay to be open and honest with our struggles, that you have given us one another so that iron can sharpen iron, God. That we know that if we confess our faults one to another and pray for one to an, pray for one to one another, God, we will be healed. So, God, I pray today, God, through this message, we will take a look and examine our lives to know that we don't have to hide behind a mask. We don't have to hide behind our sin, God, but we can come open. And, and share with our brothers and sisters in Christ, God, so that they can help lead us and guide us to Jesus. That will be our healer and deliverer, God. So we just pray over this message. God, I pray over everyone who's listening, God. Let it open their hearts and their minds to receive what you would have for them today, God. We thank you and we give you all glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. So the message today is being real with your struggles, amen. Because God is calling us to be real. You know, we can't be a bunch of fake people running around because I heard a saying before, you know, you're one day you're going to wake up and forget to be fake and the real you is going to come out. So we want to make sure that we are authentic in this walk with God. And that doesn't only mean in our healing and deliverance walking authentically, but even when we're going through something, we want to make sure we're we're, we're looking at it from a place of being real and not being delusional and, and not acting like we got it all together when we don't, amen? We want to make sure that we are real with ourselves and know how to act accordingly to get the help that we need to bring us ultimately to the healing and deliverance that God has for us. So the first thing I want to say is that your struggle does not define you, amen? It doesn't make you any less of a son and daughter of God. 
Because I think a lot of times when we go through something, if we're battling something or if we're going through pain, if we are experiencing hurt from somebody, we feel like that struggle is what defines us and it, and it gives us our identity. But that's a lie from the pit of hell. It doesn't make you any less of a son and daughter of God. Just like if you go off into this world and do something, it doesn't make you any less of a son and daughter of your natural father. It doesn't matter if you're a murderer. It doesn't matter if you're a rapist. It doesn't matter if you're a liar. Your father's blood and his seed is still in you. And there's nothing that can separate you from being your father's son or daughter. And it's the same thing I truly believe with God and our heavenly father. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and we step into the position of being a son of God, because again, not all saved people are heirs, but I'm going, well, that's a whole nother story because the Bible says he gives us the power to become the sons of God. So you got a hireling, you have a servant, you have a friend, and you have a son. But we're, that's a whole nother day teaching. But I believe when you step into that position as a son, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Amen. And, and in general, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. But I believe if you're battling and you're struggling in this life and, and attacks are coming your way and you're just feeling weary and you're feeling like something is weighing you down, there's nothing that can separate you from God being your heavenly father. I truly believe that because the Bible says in Ephesians 1 that you're sealed until the day of redemption with the Holy Spirit of promise. And when you're sealed with that seal, there's nothing that can take you out of that place with God. Amen. So even uh, it brings me back to the story with King David. As much as King David had did in his life, he was a man after God's own heart, but we see he made many mistakes along the way. But it did not separate him from God and nothing will separate you from God's love. You know, even David and I believe that David never walked out of that place with God because of his heart's posture. Even when David messed up and he went through trials and things like that, he would pray prayers like God created me a clean heart. And then he would say at other times, God, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So we see that David was not separated from God because of his heart's posture towards God. And he didn't allow his circumstance to take him out of his position with God. And a lot of times through doubt, through fear, through unbelief, through looking at a situation out of our own eyes and out of the eyes of the world, we take ourselves out of position with God. The Bible says that you're seated in heavenly places with God. When you're seated in a place, you're grounded in that position of authority. A king does not get up out of his chair to deal with, with matters that are below him. He sits in that chair and deals with the situation that's at hand through the authority of him being seated in that seat. And when you're seated in heavenly places with Christ, you fight the battle from that position, from that stance of that heavenly place. You do not have to get out of your seat because when you get out of your position, you get out of your authority. And I think at times when we start to look at situations from an earthly view, and we start to look at situations out of the lenses of doubt and unbelief and out of a false identity that God has given us, we lose our authority and our position because we get up in worry. We get up in doubt. We get up in fear. This is going to take me away from God. This is going to do this for me. This is going to do that. And when we start to give into our mind and the deception that Satan brings against our mind, we get out of our authority. And I truly believe that David was blessed the way he was, even through his mess ups, because he knew who he was in God. And this is how we have to live our lives. We have to be so secure in the identity that God has given us. We have to be so secure in, in who God is in our lives, like I spoke about earlier. You have to know the character of God to know that he's not a God that's just waiting for you to fall so he can destroy you, but he's a God that has given you a promise. He's a forgiving God. He's a loving God. He's a God that's there to help you. He's not a God that's going to be there and encourage you to keep sinning, but he's a God that's there to pick you up if you fall, to dust you off and to walk forward in your victory because he has overcome the world. Amen. And even though, and God even says, Jesus said that um, in this world, you will have trouble. So we know we're going to go through opposition. 
We know we're going to go through trials. We know that things are going to come up against us. It's going to try and tear us down. But he's given us a solution. The word says, be of good cheer, for he has overcome the world. And as Jesus has overcome the world, as he lives in you, you are an overcomer today. There is nothing that can make you not overcome. Amen. Because you've already overcome. You're already seated in that heavenly place and you've already gained the victory. And as you've overcome already in the spirit realm, you have to fight from that position of victory and now claim it and walk in it here in the natural realm. Amen. We cannot be deceived by what we see in the natural and, and look at it like, oh, this is too hard for me to overcome. This thing is going to overtake me. No, you have to look at it from the position of victory to know that you have already won the war because Jesus has already won. And as long as he lives in you, you are already an overcomer. Amen. So we have to know that we cannot pour out of an empty vessel. Amen. The last dispensation of time is the eagle ministry. And the eagle ministry is the deliverance and healing ministry. And it's the miracles ministry. And we see in the last days, there's going to arise many false Christs and false prophets. And they're going to do many miracle signs and wonders that it would almost deceive the very elect. But aside from that, God's true authority and power is going to reign in the true believers, the remnant that God is reserved for this end time and true healing and deliverance is going to take place through the believers of Christ. Because the Bible says signs and wonders will follow those that believe. So, but to be that eagle in the eagle ministry, you have to be able to be healed and delivered to minister healing and deliverance to someone else. You know, it doesn't mean you have to be perfect, but you've got to face what you've been struggling with. And allow God to help you conquer. Amen. You can't be struggling with depression and try and lead somebody else to be delivered of depression. You got to lead by example. Amen. Because how will somebody respond to you if they see you depressed and they're trying to get free from depression? How can you lead them? The Bible says the blind, when they lead the blind, when the blind leads the blind, they both fall into a ditch. You know, the, the blind cannot lead the blind. You have to have someone that's going to lead you in the direction of life. And you can be that person that can lead someone else to life today. But we have to face what we're struggling with and allow God to help us conquer. Amen. And I think us as the body, sometimes we're deceived even by the true meanings of the word of God sometimes. And, you know, we always hear um, if you're struggling with something, oh, call things that are not as though, they're, as though they were. And that's the absolute truth. That's the word. But God was showing me here that there's a difference between calling things that are not as though they were and just straight up lying. Amen. When you're calling things that are not as though they were, you're doing all that you could have done. And now you're standing on the word of God and declaring the word of God over your life. Just like my pastor, my pastor, Pastor Blaine Cuban, has went through, you know, um, stage four esophageal cancer. He's gone. He went. This was years ago. He's healed now. Praise God. But he went through um, ke um, chemotherapy. He's gone through um, the 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 tr the treatment and things like that. And after he's done all that he could do, now he's standing firm on the word and declaring that he was healed. That's calling things that are not as though they were. But if, and then the latter part is you just hiding behind what you're dealing with so that no one can see the real you or help you. So if someone comes up to you and you're depressed and they ask how you're doing, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing good. You know, just so someone doesn't see that part of you, that's not calling things that are not as though they were. That's you just hiding behind a mask so that what you're struggling and dealing with, with will not be exposed. Amen. And we're going to talk about in a little bit why we we're not real with our struggles. And there's there's some reasons. But, you know, we are all soldiers in this army. Amen. And we this is a war. You know, the Bible says in Second Timothy to endure hardness as a good soldier, that any man that wars does not entangle himself with the affairs of this life for he would go against the orders of the one that gives him you know, the assignment, the, the, the master. 
And um, the thing is, is that we are soldiers, amen? And as I always say, soldiers are not weak. They cannot back down when they see opposition coming their way. They have to be able to have the strength in the position that they are that they will give of themselves because of the purpose that's behind their mission. And us as soldiers in this life, we have a mission to be ambassadors of Christ. We have a mission to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We have a mission to carry out the, the destiny, plan, and purpose that God has in our lives in Jeremiah 29, 11, to know that we are not of our own, that it's no longer I who live, Galatians 2, 20, but Christ who lives with me because I'm crucified with him. So it's Christ who lives within me. It's no longer I who live. So when you look at it from this perspective and the position in that, you know you can face the battles head on because of the purpose that's behind your life. And as soldiers in this spiritual army with God, we don't have to run from the battle. We can Head it head on because God has given us in Ephesians chapter six, the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith. You know, our, our loins girded with truth, our feet shod with the, the preparation of the gospel of peace. We have the sword of the spirit and then we have the, the, the prayer. We have prayer as our weapon as well. And, you know, our pastor will always tell us, you know, we see the armor of God. And with the armor of God, it's everything that covers your front. But God says, but our pastor would always ask, why do we think that there's no armor on the back of us? Because we were never meant to run from the battle. We were always meant to hit the battle front and to run and face the battle head on. Because Jesus is your rear ward, it says in Isaiah. So Jesus always has your back. And, and you're not meant to turn and run from the battle, but you're meant to, to face the battle head on. Amen. And as soldiers in this army, you know, in, in, in a military um, sense, there's different ranks. And, you know, even to be a general, you know, in a, a general in, in the army or the military is only a general because of his success in defeating battles. And defeating obstacles. And that's the same thing for me and you. God wants you to be a general in his army today. He wants you to rise up to the occasion. And take your authority today. In him. To know that you are a general in this army. And you can lead others in this war to win. Because you have overcome your own set of obstacles. And your own set of battles. And when you overcome, you gain an anointing and, and you gain one up on the enemy in that area of your life because now you have an anointing over the thing that you overcome. And God is calling us today to rise up to the occasion and take up your spiritual armor today. For the weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Those strongholds of depression, those strongholds of anger, those strongholds of lust, those strongholds of unforgiveness and bitterness, those strongholds of, of just hurt and, and whatever you're dealing with, you can conquer those things and pull them down by using the weapons of your warfare. We got to stop looking to the world to conquer spiritual battles because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Amen. And it's so sad when Satan can believe the word of God more than God's children. Satan knows what you can be in the kingdom of God. And this is why he comes up against you and tries to get you to believe that you cannot conquer these things so that you will not step into your authority or your position as that general in God's army. So we got to know that the only way to have that authority, even in Revelation 3 talks about, you know, God will give us and grant us the right to sit with him on his throne as his father has given him the authority to sit with him in his throne because he overcame. So to be able to have the authority to sit in God's throne with Jesus we have to be able to overcome this world. 
Amen. And we have to get our priorities straight to know that we are not on this earth to handle earthly matters. Amen. And I'll say it that way. We are not bound to this world that earthly matters are our priority. But rather, God has given us an assignment, you know, in this earth realm, but it's a spiritual assignment that we have to obey the command of our commander in chief, which is Jesus Christ. And we got to know that what you're struggling right now with is not your end. It's not your end. But it's just your stepping stone to victory. It's your stepping stone to authority. Amen. And now what happens is, is that when we're struggling, you know, we now feel like we have to lie to cover up what we're dealing with because we don't want people to see us struggling. We don't want people to think that we're not doing right. We don't want people to know that we're not living right. You know, we, 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 we feel like in church, we have to put on this facade that we're perfect. And if we're struggling, we now are deceived and feel like we have to lie, but we're not doing anything but deceiving ourselves. And, you know, as I was studying for this and God was speaking to me about this, and he says, when you lie to cover up your struggles, you are operating out of the same spirit as false prophets operate out of. Because we see in Ezekiel 13, 10 and Jeremiah 6, 14, is that they lead people astray saying peace where there is no peace. So it's the same thing with us. We're telling people we're okay when we're not okay. We're telling people we're delivered from something that we struggled with for years and we're still struggling. And we don't realize by lying to cover up our sins so nobody will look at us as being less than, we don't realize we're giving the enemy more ammunition to keep us bound. Because again, what is concealed cannot be healed. And this is not how God wants us to operate. Amen. He wants us to be real with one another so we can have our iron sharpen one another. Amen. So moving forward in the message, you know, there are many reasons why people are not real with their struggles. And one reason people are not real with their struggles is because of, oh, excuse me, Lord, because of their pride. You know, we don't want people to know that we're struggling. We want to look like we're this superhuman with no emotions or no problems. And we want people to believe that Jesus and I are so tight that I cannot fall because I'm this great Christian. So we, because of our pride, and because we don't want people to think that we're less than or we're not human or that we are better than what we're actually are, than actually what we're dealing with, we will now lie because of our pride. So we're not real. But Proverbs 16, 18 says pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, wherefore, let him that thinketh he stands take. So we have to know. That we cannot think of ourselves better than we ought to. Amen. Because the scripture says here, he that thinks he stands, take heed lest he falls. And pride, you know, pride will deceive us and make us feel like we're, we're bigger and better than we really are. When we really are not. Amen. Because I don't know about you, but I am nothing without Jesus. And if it had not been for God who was on my side, I would not have conquered the, th the things that I had went through, and it was only by the grace of God. It was only by Jesus and his mercy that I am who I am today. And, you know, a lot of times we, ha we feel like we have to put on a facade and, and to feed that false identity of having to be perfect in the body of Christ. We allow a spirit of pride to come in us. And now we will not be real with what we're dealing with because we don't want others to think that we're not living right or we don't want others to, to look at us a different type of way. Amen. So pride is the first reason why um, people will not be real with their struggles. The second reason people are not real with their struggles is because of a, of a filthy spirit called condemnation. 
And a lot of times, if someone we look up to or even someone who shares a similar faith with us will ask us how we're doing, we will lie and say that we are okay when we're really not because we don't want to feel condemnation. Amen? We sometimes think that people expect more out of us than we can actually give. And now when we're struggling, you know, we, we, we have this... Um, we have this false belief, again, that we feel like we have to be perfect and, and we, we think that people will expect more out of us and that we should not be struggling in this life, but we should be perfect human beings walking around. So now what happens is we have to lie to cover up the truth so people don't see the real you so that guilt, shame, and condemnation will not overtake you. Amen. But all of this that I'm talking about is a lie from the pit of hell. Amen. Satan wants you to do that very thing so that he can keep you in bondage. He wants you to think that you're not a son if you struggle. And he wants you to think that you aren't saved if you're not 100% perfect. But again, this is why um, he wants to hide in these secrets. Amen. And convince you that people are going to judge you. So that you can continue to struggle until somebody, you know, until there's a moment where you may fall and somebody may see. And there's a, there's a saying that says closed mouths can't get fed. So we see here that through condemnation, guilt, and shame, Satan will use those lies to keep us bound to our sin. So that we, so to keep us from feeling the guilt and the shame of the struggle that we're going through, Satan will have us lie. So that we don't feel that. But again, this is why, like I said earlier, we have to be so secure in our faith with God. And we have to be so secure in the identity that God has given us and, and has called us to be. To know that, you know, um, Romans says that there's no, therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ. So if you're struggling with something, you don't have to feel condemned, you know. When you walk after the spirit and not after the flesh, condemnation should not be something that you're dealing with. Now, if you are willfully sinning, you are now walking after the flesh and not after the spirit. But the scripture says, I believe it's Romans 12. I could be wrong. But let me check. Because I want to read it so that you guys can see. Uh, it is actually not Romans 12. Let's see. Romans chapter 8. So it says, Romans chapter 8. Therefore is there, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk after who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So the so the um key here is the spirit. If you're struggling and walking after the spirit of God, there should be no condemnation that comes upon you. But let me say this, because a lot of people won't teach it this way or say things this way. But if you're walking after the flesh, if you're walking after the ways of this world and you're willfully sinning, condemnation actually can have a right to come upon you. Because the scripture here says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Therefore, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ who walk not after the flesh. So if you're walking after the flesh, Satan has a legal right to bring condemnation upon you. But the key here is walking after the spirit. Again, like I said, when you are doing all that you can do and standing... You do not need condemnation to come upon you because there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ. But we have to know that when you're going through something, again, like I said earlier, it does not define you. But if you're not secure in who God has called you to be or even secure in this word, if you don't believe that there's no condemnation in Christ, condemnation will come upon you and you will give into it. Because again, through the doubt, unbelief, and the fear, it will give Satan a legal right to have you bound to your sin. And that's the third one 
That's the third thing that I'm going to bring up of the reasons for being not being real with your struggle is because people just outright want to stay in their sin. People don't want to deal with the backlash that will come of revealing their sin because they want to stay in it. Some people will lie about their struggles because they legit just want to sin. And there's some of us that, that have done that and still do that. You know, and, and these people know that if they're real and tell people, these people that they're telling will encourage them to get healed and delivered. And now the conviction becomes stronger. So it's so much easier just to lie so that they can stay comfortable in their sin. So we've gone through three things already. We've gone through con um, pride will keep somebody from not being real with their struggles. Condemnation will um, keep somebody from not being real with their struggles. Um, people wanting to stay in their sin will keep people from be being real with their struggles. And the last one that I want to talk about is um, a false identity will have people um, not be real with their struggles. And sometimes people who have a false identity, what they will do, they have a mentality of thinking that they will get noticed if people don't see them struggling. And it makes them feel a false sense of being worthy. So it's all out of a false identity. So the mentality is, is if I present myself as perfect, someone will notice me. And now I can be used in the areas that I want to be used in because it looks like I'm living right. It looks like, again, I'm so tight with Jesus that I ain't struggling. And, and through that false sense of feeling worthy, it convinces someone they have to lie about their struggles so that they look perfect so that they can be used by God. But again, you have to be secure in the word and not in who you are as a flesh being. Or not in who you think you are. You have to be secure in the word. The Bible says your gifts will make room for you. And even will bring you before great men. So if my gifts will make room for me. Why do I have to lie. To make and, and look perfect. So that my gift will make a room for me. No your gifts will make room for you. When you go through this process. Let me tell you. Someone being a pastor at a young age. Who didn't even want it. Who, who, or who, I'll be real with you, her, for someone who didn't even ask for it, you know, there was a, there's a level of overcoming you have to go through to be put in a position or in the position that God has called you to be. You know, you have to go through a level of life and experiences. You know, people know I went through addiction. I've went through false comfort. I've went through you know, trials and things, you know, through depression and all these things. And, you know, to be secure in the position that God has you in, you have to go through a level of overcoming. And through those trials of you overcoming and actually conquering those things, you learn what it really means to appreciate the battle and appreciate what you learn from the battle. And a lot of times... People want the glory but not have the story. But it's the story that actually gets the glory, right? It's the story and how God worked in the story that God gets the glory through to be able to bring you to that place where you can minister to someone else. You know, how can you minister hope if you never went through hopelessness? How can you minister deliverance if you never had to be delivered from something? How can you tell somebody about a savior if you never had to be saved? You know, and a lot of times people just see others in a position that they want to and they lust after the position instead of opening themselves to going through what God would ordain them to go through to bring them to the other side so that they can get the anointing. You know, the anointing, is I believe that a level of the anointing is given to you when you choose to serve God. But I believe the anointing increases in your life as you overcome. You know, and as you go through the trials, as you allow God to break you, as you allow God to build your integrity, as you allow God to cause you to be humble, this is where all the anointing 
increases in your life and you have power. Where someone can't cast out a devil, you can come over to them and have the authority. Where the devil will laugh in someone's face, you can walk up to them and them devils will be intimidated because the level of the anointing that's on your life through you going through the battles, through you going through the trials and being real with them, you know, not hiding behind the struggles and acting like you're perfect, but actually going through the battle. And a lot of times we will lie and tell people we're okay to get in good graces with people. And we think by lying and putting on this facade that we're perfect, that we're going to get in good graces with somebody and we'll be blessed by those people because we're not struggling. You know, and there's a script, there's a story in second Samuel chapter one, where there was a young, this is when uh, King Saul had died and King David was getting ready to take over the throne. And King Saul and Jonathan and his sons had just died. The Philistines had just slayed um, King Saul's sons. And King Saul just saw the agony of what was going on and asked one of his servants to stab him uh, with the sword. But the servant would not. So King Saul ended up committing suicide. So a young man came out of the camp of Saul. And told David, King David, because King David was getting ready to be the next king. So this young man came out of the, um, the, the, the house of Saul and came to King David and told David that he killed Saul. And he presented Saul's crown and a bracelet to David as a token. So here we could assume that this man was trying to get in good graces with the new king of Israel. Off of a lie. Because we know that we see in, um, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 30 that Saul killed himself. So we know this man did not kill Saul. But this man presented himself to David as he, killing, as he killed King Saul to get in good graces with David. So fast forwarding in this chapter of 2 Samuel chapter 1, we see that David had reverence for King Saul, even though King Saul was wicked. And even though King Saul tried to kill David, David still had reverence for God's anointed. And David and his men mourned the loss of King Saul. And now, because the word says, because this man had touched God's anointed, he was now ordered to death. So even though this man lied, even though this man did not kill Saul, he came to David to get in good graces with David. David ordered this man to die because he touched God's anointed. And this is what we do at times sometimes. We feel like that we have to make ourselves look good so that people will accept us, so that people will look at us differently, so that people can feel like we're worthy to be used even at times. But we don't realize that when we're lying to get in good graces with people, just like this man, his life was required of him because he lied. This is what happens to us spiritually. We end up dying spiritually because we're still stuck in sin and we're living a double life. We're proclaiming we're healed. We're proclaiming we're, we're delivered and we're living a life of a lie. And we're deceived because we are not being real with what we're dealing with. And let me tell you, God wants us to be real. Amen. I don't care what you're going through today. You could be going through homosexuality. You could be going through depression. You could be going through anger. You could be going through thoughts, mental illness, whatever is going on. You could be going through whatever it is in the world. But you can be real with who you are today. Because those things you're dealing with is not who you are. Again, your circumstance does not define who you are. And God, even if you're struggling with sin, God is a God of second chances. And he's a God of third chances. And he's a God of four chances. And so on and so on and so on. My God is a forgiving God. My, the Bible says that his mercies are new every day. I can wake up tomorrow morning and I could mess up tonight and wake up tomorrow morning. And there's a whole new batch of mercies that is just covering me. You know, and God's grace is, is, is um, getting what we didn't deserve. And mercy is not getting what we did deserve. Amen. We were born into, a, we were shaped in iniquity, the Bible says. Amen. We were born into this sinful world. But God's mercy and his grace is so great 
that even if you're struggling with sin, God still loves you. But he wants you to conquer these things. You don't ever have to feel ashamed to speak about what you're going through or what's going on in your life. Amen. This is why we have family. And I ain't talking about blood family. I'm talking about the family of God. Because I'm telling you here, there's some people that is closer to you and you can trust more in your in your God family than your blood family. But this is why God has brought people in your life. That's the family of God to help lift you up and encourage you. And this is not saying again to go tell everybody in the world your business, you know, because there are some nosy people out there. There's some Jezebels out there. There's some people that don't have your best interests at heart that will go and talk and gossip. But I'm just talking about finding a couple people that you really trust, people you look up to, some leaders maybe in your church that you really trust, some anointed men and women of God that's gone through something, that know something about the word, not only by reading it, by, but by experiencing it, you know, and, and find a safe place to be able to be an outlet to share what you're dealing with, you know, find those that have overcome that can help lead you into real results. And, and not only that, but take heed to what they're saying. You know, don't think you have it all made up in your mind and you're just going to talk to somebody, you know, just to make yourself feel better, to make it look like that you're trying to get help when you've already made up in your mind that you ain't going to listen to anything they're saying. If you're going to go to somebody to speak to them, take heed to what they're saying. Because let me tell you, God has placed people in our lives for a reason. He's placed people in our lives to be able to help us go through this thing called life. You know, I always say that, there's that saying in the world that it takes a village to raise a child. Let me tell you, it takes a village to continue to be an adult, you know, because Satan wants us to isolate ourselves. Satan wants us to be able to, to get us by ourselves and, and take us off to the side of the world so that we can um, fall into depression. He wants us to fall into being alone and feel like nobody loves us and nobody cares about us. And this is why it's so important to be in tune with the body of Christ. You know, um, Hebrews 10, 25, you know, not forsaken the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, lifting one another up, so much more as we see that day approaching. What is that day? That day is the day of the Lord. As we see all that's going on in the world, as we see that the world basically is coming to an end soon, as we see the sign of the times of the world, just darkness overtaking the earth. God has told us that great darkness has covered the face of the earth, but the glory of God will shine upon his people. Amen. That is Isaiah. I believe it's 59. Uh, no, not Isaiah 59. Was Isaiah 62 maybe? It might be Isaiah 62. Um, hold on. Let me find that because that's a good, that's one of my favorite scriptures. But it's, um, uh, let Isaiah 60. I thought it was Isaiah 62. It's Isaiah 60, dot, dot, two. But it's, it says, Arise and shine, for the light is come, and the glory of God is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. So even though we see that day approaching, even though we see the darkness coming upon the earth, God's glory is coming upon his people. And this is why we want to be able to be around the people that God's glory is on. Because when you're going through that darkness, that light of the glory of God that's shining in someone will minister to you and bring you. Because let me tell you, the, the light wants to be given off to give other people light. And now the light is transferable from me now to you. And now you can give light to somebody else because the Bible says you are the light of the world. Amen. God has, has set you on a city. You know, you're a light on a city that lights up a whole city that all, that all men can see. So we want to make sure we have people to go to, that good friend to go to to minister to us. But also we want to be that good friend. 
And how can I be that good friend to minister to somebody, to be able to give hope to somebody when they're struggling? If someone comes to me and, and is open with me that they're struggling, how can I be that good friend to them? First of all, you have to be committed to the process yourself. You have to be working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, right? And what does fear and trembling mean? Fear means with reverence to God, but trembling means brokenness and humility. You cannot be working out your salvation thinking that you better than everybody else. You got to work out this salvation with humility and brokenness before God to know that God, to say, God, empty me. You know, Smith Wigglesworth, Sister Corey said this the other day. That a lot of times we say that it's less of me and more of God, but it's really not. That's not true. It should be none of me and all of him. And that's how we should be living our lives, is being committed to the process, to be able to help somebody. We got to be committed to the process ourselves. You know, going through the healing and deliverance process for ourselves, to be able to minister from a place of empathy to somebody. You know, like I said before, if I've overcome depression, it's going to mean so much more to somebody that I'm ministering to that has depression. That I can tell them, look, I went through what you went through. And I, I know a Savior who loves me so much, that I love so much, that his name is Jesus. That he can bring you out of this thing. You know, and that's the thing when you overcome these trials and you just let go and not hold on to these things anymore. This will bring increase again to the anointing in your life to bring you to help others with their struggles. Amen. Second Corinthians 1, 3 and 4 says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who comforts me. And the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulations that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble by the comfort by where ourselves have been comforted. So when God comforts you in your trials, you now can use that comfort that God gave you to comfort somebody else. Amen. So we got to know that we got to be committed to this process to be a good friend, to encourage somebody and to lead someone into to healing and deliverance. You have to first be committed to the process yourself. Secondly, to be a good friend, when somebody comes to you and confides in you, how can you be that friend that, that someone needs? You have to be a man and a woman of prayer. You have to be a man and woman of prayer. James 5.16 says, confess your faults one to another and pray for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It's not just the confessing. Of the sin that bring or the of or the fault of someone that brings healing, but it's also the prayer. And when you find a righteous man and woman of God, what does that word righteous mean? It means doing right. It's that simple. A righteous man and woman of God is someone who believes in God and believes in the word and actually does right in the sight of God. That's a righteous man and woman of God. And the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You know, he who abides in God and, and as God abides in him, he can ask what he pleases and it shall be given unto him. So you want to find those people that are abiding in God. You want to find those people and you want to be, I mean, not even find those people. You want to be that person that when you take your request to the throne of grace boldly, God will hear your prayers because you're walking upright with him. He says he will withhold no good thing. To those who walk uprightly in him. So you want to be that man and woman of prayer. That can reach the throne room of God. Because you have favor with God. Through living this right life with God. And then uh, th the next thing that you have to do. To be that good friend. Is being that person of humility. That can look beyond the natural struggle. A lot of times us as humans. And we've all done this. You know ain't nobody perfect. Ain't nobody exempt from this but we we sometimes will look at somebody who's in a trial and sometimes we will judge them based on what we see instead of looking beyond the natural and this is how you can be a good friend to lead someone to healing and deliverance is being someone of humility and looking beyond what you see in the natural realm knowing that the same way we struggled or are struggling others do as well 
And this is why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians to see no man after the flesh, but rather look at the spirit and the soul to know that this is a man and woman of God. This is a soul that God died for, that Jesus died for. You know, we have to have empathy for one another and not judge one another, but rather pray and help one another and love one another back to life. You know, if you find someone that is so out there, be able to love them. It's that love that's going to cover that multitude of sin. You know, if you see a brother or sister slip away or even backslide, you know, calling them and checking up on them, seeing how they're doing, you know, not telling them you need to get back right with God, you need to get in church, you know, not condemning them, but rather just loving on them, telling them that they're missed, telling them that they're still loved, telling them that they have not gone that far, that God cannot heal them and deliver them. You know, this is what we do as Christians that bring hope to one another is loving people. This is how the world will know that we are Christ's disciples by the love that we have for one another. That's the whole gospel. The whole gospel is, 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 is summed up in one law. Loving God, loving your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Loving your neighbor as yourself. That's the whole gospel. And that is where God has called us to be, is that love. You know, he wants us to love one another. You know, uh, Romans 12, 3 says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Amen. So God is God and he's the God of all comfort. And we got to lead people back to life through the love of God. Amen. Galatians 6, 1 through 3. And this is the last scripture I'm going to end with. But brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man thinks of himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Amen. The Bible says here to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness when you see them overtaken in a fault. What does that word meekness mean? That word meekness just means gentleness and kindness. You know, a lot of times when we see somebody struggling, we feel like we got to go hard on them and tell them, look, you need to get right again. Like I said before, we feel like we got to tell them, you got to get yourself together. You know better. Let me tell you, when someone is struggling or look, trust me, when somebody's sinning, they already know they're sinning. They don't need someone to come along, even in an, in an addiction. Let me tell you, let me educate you all for a second. If someone is struggling with an addiction... You cannot come up to this person and be hard on them and tell them, you need to get this right. You know better than this, blah, blah. Even, li listen, after a while, you can. But when, there's, when, they, when you're just now encountering somebody, you can't go hard on them like that because what they'll do, again, that condemnation, that guilt and shame will come in, and now they're just going to run deeper into the drug or alcohol or whatever it is they're struggling with. Amen? We got to restore people with meekness. We got to restore people with love. We got to restore people with kindness. You know, and the Bible even says here to consider yourself, lest you be tempted. You know, if you think you're better than someone else, God may allow a temptation to fall upon you so that you can be humbled and know exactly what that person is going through. So it's always best to not go that route and judge somebody, but it's best to just love someone and to love them back to life. Amen. Because God calls us to bear one another's burdens. When one is weak, you are there to help take the load off and help them get back on their feet. You know, and, and as I was um, reading the scripture, God had like given me a vision of two hikers hiking up a, 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 a hill or a mountain or whatever you want to call it. And you know how they have those huge backpacks on their back? God showed me somebody... There's two people and one person was, they were standing next to each other and one person had the backpack on and someone else didn't. And when that one person who was carrying the backpack got tired, the other person took on that burden to give that person, you know, the strength to get back to be able to carry that thing again or carry the next trial or, or the next thing. And that's what we have to do with one another. When you see somebody dealing with someone, something, bear their burden. 
And I'm not saying bear the burden emotionally and take on what they're struggling with. If you see somebody struggling with addiction, I ain't telling you to go be addicted with them. I'm telling you take on the burden in prayer and encouragement. Be there to help them carry that load. Show them that they're not there alone. Be there to love them and show them the love of God and encourage them that this is not their end, that they can overcome. And they already are an overcomer in Jesus' name. So to end, we are our brother's keeper. Amen. And we have to be honest with one another because God doesn't want us going around being broken little boys and girls in an adult body anymore. God doesn't want us to be holding on to unforgiveness towards someone that hurt you 20 years ago that's living their life. God doesn't want you to, to harbor anger and resentment when he's given you the joy of the Lord to be your strength. God wants us today to experience the life-changing healing and delivering power of God to bring someone else to healing and deliverance. Again, like I said before, you cannot pour out of an empty vessel. You have to be committed to this process first before you can help somebody else. You are the light of the world. Amen. And as God has comforted you, that same comfort that God comforts you with, you'll be able to comfort someone else with. So today we got to know to be, we have to be real with our struggles today. Do not feel ashamed to tell your brother or your sister that you're dealing with something, but rather expose the devil because he hides in secrets. He wants to hide in those secrets. He wants to make you feel like you're nothing. But when you expose what you're dealing with, you can experience the love of God through your brothers and sisters that will help you overcome that very thing. So Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day, God, and we thank you for this word. And God, I pray right now over everyone that's struggling with something and they feel like they cannot tell someone or they feel like they have to have that mask, God, to hide behind that struggle. I take authority over the lies of the enemy. I take authority over the deception of the enemy. God, and I pray right now that you would bring a sense of freedom from these lies and the false identity and the bondage that people are dealing with in their mind and the deception that they feel like they need to be perfect to be a Christian. And God, I just take authority over every spirit that's coming against the people of God, the antichrist spirit that's trying to keep people bound in sin, in struggles, in hurt, in unforgiveness right now. God, and I ask you to set all these people free right now under the sound of my voice. Bring healing and deliverance to your people today, God, so that we can be the hands and feet of Christ and now go and minister light and life to others, God, as you have ministered light and life to us. God, for we know that the entrance of thy word giveth light, God. So we pray that as Jesus comes in our heart, who is the word made flesh, God, we pray right now that that Jesus that's within us will give us light and illuminate all the darkness in us, God. In Jesus' name, God, and bring us to healing and deliverance today. God, I thank you, and I give you all glory, honor, and praise. And the church says, amen. All right, I love you guys. I'll see you all next week.